thank you, Sheikh Mohammed Ali, for that fantastic lecture. And I definitely know what you mean about the convertible yo-yo hijab, so <laughs> a bit disappointing. Um, we're already receiving many emails from viewers around the world, um, some of which are excuses made by males as not to observe hijab, so that will be very interesting to see the answer of. Um, as we said, we're going to give priority to the panel um, in front of us, so the males and the females. Um, so we'll take questions from the panel in front of us, inshallah, then we will go to the emails sent in. And as I said, for the viewers watching worldwide, you can email us and call us with any questions you may have. So can we start with Akbar Ali Ali Dina? So if you present your question to Sheikh Muhammad Ali. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Um, what are the rules on hijab for both men and women uh, when searching for a partner for marriage? Islam is a religion which is realistic. In other words, it is not as rigid and as, for example, non flexible as some people are led to believe. In Sharia law, when it comes to marriage, our fuqaha are clear in the statement that, for example, when it comes to the male and they have considered and identified an individual who they deem, for example, a potential spouse, then it is permissible for them to look at either a picture or them in person at their face as well as their hair only for the instance that they need and without any lustful intentions. In other words, this permissibility exists as well as, of course, their ability to engage in a discussion or for them to talk. But at the same time, this talking uh, needs to be restricted with no terminology that is normally referred to or utilized by lovers or those who utilize or use emotional phrases, it needs to be um, to the extent that is necessary for them to identify what they need to know from the other person. We have mentioned before in this place that Allah Taala knows your intentions. So I have seen some brothers who have said, you know, I need several meetings with the uh, person whom I'm thinking to get married to because I want to find out more about their lives. And if they are true in their intention, then this is permissible. But it should certainly um, be devout of looking at that individual with any wrong intentions. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, we'll go to the sister side now, inshallah. So we'll have Ismat um, Jiraj first. So if you present your question. Salam alaikum. I do have a question that was emailed in earlier this week from Mariam Ghazvi in Manchester. I know we did discuss this um, a short while ago, but what would you say to a woman who's already married and her husband now tells her she's not allowed to wear hijab? What are Islam's rulings on this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be feared and Allah should be feared alone. This is a problem that sometimes we have in certain quarters of the community whereby sadly the husband instead of encouraging and performing amr bil ma'ruf and nahi anil munkar and standing alongside the, his wife to ensure that they rise to the challenge against all the difficulties they become an obstacle and for this female or for this lady or anyone there who is under pressure from their husbands not to wear the hijab our ulama categorically state that the husband must not be obeyed in this occasion and therefore it is incumbent upon her to observe the hijab and to fight for her hijab just like how many people have done so but we dis we encourage discussion and dialogue amongst the husband and wife in any disagreement whether it's to do with the hijab the style of the hijab the extent of the hijab there needs to be constant discussion and if there is no resolving of the situation then expert opinion should be sought and when we mean expert opinion we don't necessarily mean always you know turning to your friend who manage to, manages to give you some pieces of advice which sometimes can be destructive we mean people who are aware and have certain knowledge about what constitutes the hijab and the importance of it therefore she needs to rely on Allah observe patience and be steadfast and try as much as possible to convince her husband of the necessity and the need but she should never take it off due to her husband 
Thank you very much, Chef. It's quite unfortunate because a lot of people do email with that problem, so it's quite important to see that people still have that problem. Can we move to the brother's side with um, Brother Abbas Hash Hash Hasham? Sorry. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. My question is Should a Muslim avoid all purposeless conversation with non mahram? Are purposeless conversations with non mahram haram or are they makro? What if a man's mother asks him to meet a non mahram without any purpose? Should he mention his preference to avoid such a meeting or should he just agree to his mother's request? Thank you. You might have to repeat some of the questions. Uh, with regards to conversations between non-mahram, they should be kept to necessary. In other words, what is required? And some people object to this. Our ulama, as generally Islamic law states that uh, prevention is better than cure. And this is the message of the Quran. In other words, we find the Quran speaking and directing this command to not only the wives of the Prophet, but also to all believing women. فَلَا تَخْضَعْنَ بِالْقَوْلِ فَيَطْمَعُ الَّذِي فِي قَلْبِهِ مَرَضٍ Allah says clearly in the Quran, do not soften your voice or beautify it intentionally to draw the attention of others. And this is of course a problem that sometimes when there is unnecessary discussions and talk, especially online, when there is chatting going on between na-mahrams, it becomes an initiation, a stage by which the shaitan becomes stronger. The shaitan once told Prophet Nuh ala nabiyina wa ala alihi wa alayhi afdal salatu wa salam. He said to him, let me give you some advice. Nuh said, I don't want it. He said, no, but I'll give it to you because you've made me unemployed and there's nobody to deceive. I will give it to you. He said, what? He said, I become strong in three areas. When an individual, a human being becomes angry, then I'm strongest then. When the human being has to judge between two, especially if one of them is a family member or close relative, and when a human being is alone with another woman, I become their third. And this also applies when you're sitting there in front of the computer. Right? It's not just only in, in physical contact or, or discussion when you see somebody. Therefore, unnecessary discussions, and this is left to the individual. I'm not going to tell you what is necessary and what is not. But for example, discussing the British weather is certainly unnecessary. You know, we know where to draw the line in our discussions because the shaitan is ready and waiting. Like we said, the shaitan has many arrows and they can catch you. The shayateen can catch you in any shape or form. And therefore, if the mother arranges a particular meeting, which is not for the purpose of marriage and it is unnecessary discussion, then once more one has to understand the taklif al-shari'i, their Islamic obligation, fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember, Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala beautifully in the Holy Quran speaks about a concept known as libasu taqwa the garments of piety many mufassirin say this garment of piety has many meanings dual or for example three different meanings they say this refers to hijab because an individual who is wearing a hijab is indeed practicing god consciousness but at the same time it's referred to the social element or the spiritual element and that's what they engage in discussions they fear allah وَلِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ And the garments of taqwa, Allah says in the Qur'an, undisputable, undeniable, right? says the لِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ It is better, Allah loves it. So, we need something to constantly remind us about why and what is the purpose behind our discussions and in conversations that we have with people who are non-mahram. Fearing Allah is the most important element. Thank you very much. Um, shall we break it up? Because we're getting many um, emails from viewers from around the world. So let me just read one email out, inshallah. Then we'll come back to our okay. panel of guests. Um, this email was emailed in from Sister Matsuma. It says, these days, many men don't want hijab because they say it's not professional when in business. This comes from men in our community. And this is the reason why most women are forced to take off their hijab. 
So I'm not sure if she's referring to hijab that women are forced to take off, but men think that hijab is not professional and when in business. So what would you say to that? I think it's very important to raise awareness. And when it comes to subjects of hijab, I was speaking to one of my brothers who I said to him that there is a program we will be discussing the hijab. He said, it's not for me, you know, it's for the sisters. Why should I come? And this is unfortunately an idea that exists in the minds of some of our brothers that hijab is a subject that is specifically tailored and geared towards the ladies and our sisters. Whereas when they're asked and they're challenged by many people outside in the world or in the community today to understand and to explain the philosophy of hijab, they struggle to give sound reasons based on the Quran and the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet and the Ma'asumin alayhum salam. Therefore, raising awareness amongst the men is of great importance. And once more, from this particular place, we call upon our brothers around the world to really understand their obligations and their duties and to be supportive. It is already difficult for our, some sisters when they are faced by intimidation and ridiculing in places in the uh, Islamophobic attacks that some of them are subjected to in the West, it is already difficult for them to uphold and observe hijab. Let's not make it even more difficult. Let's be supportive and stand side by side because this is definitely something that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is our objective in life. Thank you very much, Sheikh. I know there's many viewers sending in their emails, so stay tuned and keep watching, so I will read out their emails soon. Um, let's move to the brother's side now with um, Brother Samir Merchant. Um, just a quick question. Uh, I'm under rendition because I've been given these three questions and I'm asked to summarize it. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to be do justice to all of three, but uh, one of the questions is that the Quran says, like Rafid Din, which says basically there's no compulsion in religion. Um, so is it compulsory for the women who come to the mosque to wear the hijab? Uh, because uh, the second question which continues is that, isn't it hypo hypocritical that the women are actually forced to wear the hijab or actually at least put under pressure to wear the hijab when she comes in the mosque, but at the same time when she's at her job or at her workplace, she's not wearing the hijab. So it is hypocritical in that sense. And the second question is, uh, again, should, should women just stay in the house or was she, is she, or the women who actually come out and uh, want, you know, wants to uh, raise awareness about peace and she wants to talk about, against tyranny, what's the level of social hijab that she should actually uh, monitor and she should actually keep for herself? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Three important questions. First of all, in community functions and in gatherings, there should certainly be an emphasis and a strong encouragement for the sisters who are attending to be observing hijab for a number of reasons. The first, of course, is due to the sanctity and the sacredness of the place that they're coming to, whether it's a Husayniya, an Imam Barga, a mosque, any other place in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worshipped or his remembrance is mentioned. When I went to the Vatican a few years ago, and those brothers and sisters who have been to the Vatican, you'll see that when you stand outside, as before you enter, there is a huge notice. It says that, for example, the males cannot enter wearing shorts. The females must have their, for example, arms covered, if I can remember correctly. Therefore, it is not something that is restricted to the religion of Islam only and to Muslim areas of worship due to the respect that we have for these places, A. B, we consider those individuals who do not wear hijab for many reasons as possible sources of fitna in other words they when they come to areas in which certainly men can be seen and men can see them and the majority of problems and i'm going to be shot for this but the majority of problems is met weddings and mixed gatherings you know when it comes to these types of social events we find the biggest problem arises there, whereby the male is somehow, some of them are tempted to look at certain individuals. Some of our fem females, the ladies, they move from one table to another. They speak to every single gent in the hall. 
Not that I have noticed it, I've been told about it, of course. Um, and uh, the idea then is that we have a problem. Therefore, in order to avoid this situation, and we mentioned that the Quran talks about preventing the problems from happening. In other words, it's a preventative measure. Allah says, لا تقربوا الزنا. Do not come close to fornication. Not just not perform the adultery, but not even think about it. And all the preventative measures involve this issue of social hijab and the physical hijab. And that's why in community functions we emphasize the need for hijab at least to be observed. Secondly, is it hypocritical for them to be wearing hijab here and not elsewhere? Indeed it may be, but at least they honor and respect the sanctity of the place that they are gathering and do not necessarily be a cause for uh, looks which are to be avoided. Indeed, it is our wish and our hope that the hijab is practiced everywhere. And you know, sometimes, and I, mention, I won't mention which country, but in certain countries where people have to wear the hijab, when you're, as soon as the plane leaves that country, you see immediately, you know, the convertible comes back, you know, and many, many of our sisters take the hijab off, you know, they wear it in that country because they have to, and once they're out of it, they take it off. Of course, this uh, shows a lack of understanding of the whole uh, process and the whole obligation. Should they stay at home? They shouldn't stay at home if they feel that there is a need for them to be in the public arena. If there is no unnecessary gender mixing and interaction which may involve them to fall into haram. This is the exact terminology that our fuqaha say. That if you are out there in the workplace and you cannot hold yourself and there's a possibility that you may fall in something which is not permissible, then it, it is not permissible for you or you should not leave the house or at least engage or go to this area. However, we need our sisters to be at the workplace. We need them to represent Islam and importantly, we need them to speak out. It's not good enough for people like me to continuously just stand there and say, yes, hijab is liberating for women. Women actually love wearing the hijab, the Muslim women. They find it something which is honorable and dignified and they feel a special, it's like a pearl, you know a pearl, it's actually covered and in order for you to get it, you need to take off the shell. It's like a pearl which is precious. They need to speak to the world and when the world tells them, is Islam oppressing you? Is it a, 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 a religion of injustice against you? They say, no, here I am, nobody's forced me. Not my husband, not my father, nobody. I wear it out of my choice and I love it. How beautiful it is for them to say that. But of course, working outside and interacting with men has its certain conditions and rules that are clearly stipulated in Islamic law and jurisprudence, and this needs to be observed. Powerful words. I'm sure all of us females echo those words as well. Um, you mentioned about um, hijab in functions and um, in weddings, etc. We have a question submitted which is similar to that. But this question says, um, what is exact rulings in Islam regarding mixed parties in weddings when women wear their Islamic, their best clothes and have full makeup? So what is the Islamic rulings? And they do not put makeup? I know, th and they have full and makeup. They have makeup. <laughs> yeah. The answer has already been given. <laughs> um, of course, this, this is a problem. Um, there isn't a particular ruling in this regard, which is categorical, but in a sense that any gathering which uh, may involve interactions or unnecessary looks and in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most certainly disobeyed uh, should not be arranged or should not be at least attended if possible. Now, when it comes to practically speaking, I speak to many of the brothers and sisters and they say, you know what, it's the cousin or someone important and you know the family will be upset. Many times we have to deal with this issue sensitively and uh, um, involve ourselves in discussion. Essentially is about our obligation and our duties and responsibilities. Many people fear speaking out, but speaking out doesn't have to be in public. We have our duties of enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. And unfortunately, we have certain practices that most certainly our, our and before them, the Holy Prophet, 
peace and blessings be upon him and his holy progeny will be displeased about and therefore when we attend these gatherings if we have to attend them then we at least attending them should be observing both the social hijab and the physical hijab but we need to practice our responsibility by ensuring that we tell the people who are responsible that should this should necessarily be done and if we feel it absolutely necessary to attend then we practice what we preach out of of the utmost importance thank you very much now let's go to the sister side get a question from there so can we have sister fatima ramji Assalamualaikum. Um, I've recently heard that women are not allowed to wear coloured hijabs. Is this true? And if so, why? I'm sorry, women are not allowed to? Wear coloured hijab. hijabs. Coloured hijab. Okay. When it comes to hijab, there are specific elements about the hijab which we mentioned is a general principle. The hijab, if it's worn with a certain form of decoration or colouring with the intention to attract becomes non-permissible. That is the ruling. In other words, the ruling is based on the intention of the individual when wearing these particular garments of whether they wish other people to look at them and to admire them. And that becomes a source of hurma in fiqh. And therefore, this uh, falls, the same question you know, could be asked about many other elements within hijab, whether, for example, certain um, patterns are present in a certain hijab or not. Of course, if we're talk talking about the most perfect scenario, then it should be simple with, with nothing that would attract the attention. But essentially, it returns to the intention of the human being. Likewise, for example, and I'll ask this question myself and answer it. Uh, kuhl. You know what kuhl is? You know, when it's practiced, placed under the eyes. Our ulama, for example, Ayatollah Sistani, uh, Hafizahullah says that kuhl for the females is permissible, yet it must not be placed with the intention of drawing attention. And that's the difference. Sometimes it's placed for medical reasons, sometimes people are used to, used to putting it on. But once the intention is there, then it becomes problematic. Thank you very much. Can I just say that if anyone in the audience has any questions, just put your hand up and then we'll go to them. Despite, I know there's a panel. Okay, there's a question at the back. I know Hussein um, had a question as well on the front and there's a question at the back. We'll go to Hussein first and then we'll go to the back, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa I'm not trying to question the Holy Quran, um, but um, I'm quite curious to, um, to know your opinion on this. Should the Quran not in, or tell the uh, women first to wear appropriate hijab or wear appropriate clothes not to put makeup on because if they do that then the men will surely not need to lower their gaze because they put a lot of makeup on they wear tight clothes sometimes the men are attracted to that it's it's, it's automatic and therefore then they, they have to lower their gaze so shouldn't the quran inform the ladies first to please you know <laughs> wear appropriate clothes then, so then the men don't have to lower their gaze yeah, in the interest of fairness, our sisters can't defend themselves. I will defend them <laughs> and say they, they might say, well, it's all men's fault. Why do they have to look? <laughs> right? Well, no one's asked you to look, you know. Uh, no, let's uh, look at this uh, objectively. When it comes to the Holy Quran, of course, the Quran is very categorical and very clear on this issue that uh, the responsibility falls on both males and females. It's a dual responsibility is not just for the females and neither is just for the males they both have to uphold and observe the regulations and the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is a dress which is modest and chaste and not gaze or look at each other in an unacceptable lustful manner so if the society, both males and females, were to observe these recommendations, and certainly the Quran speaks about it, it does not uh, ignore it. It's clear, as we mentioned in chapter 24, speaks about the importance of lowering the gaze, speaks about the issue of the need for women at that time not to stamp their feet so that the jewelry that they wear and the zina that they had adorned themselves with, the people could hear it. And now our fuqaha have extrapolated a number of rulings based on this. This was just an example given in the Quran at that time. But this necessarily means that any fe me means by which the female draws attention to herself is not permissible in Sharia law. 
And hence, yes, makeup, anything which beautifies the female should not be put on, definitely. But at the same time, the males as well should be practicing the social element as we keep banging on about it, and that is to lower the, their gaze. The problem is, of course, that in a society which is predominantly non-Muslim, they find it something usual for them to be glancing and looking at every Tom, Dick and Harry who passes by, and they find this something which is, you know, satisfying their eyes and their lustful intentions. And they have no values and no principles. And hence, in this society, it becomes difficult. But normally, in a Muslim society, if the values of the religion are upheld, then the Quranic principles can be established. Thank you very much. We're getting a lot of emails coming through, but we'll go back to the panel, and then there's two, well, three hands up, so we'll go back to the, f um, right at the back. But first, can we go to the panel to Chris Mortimer, and then we'll go to the back um, with the brother raising his hand. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa rahmatullah. Uh, my question was to do with the uh, mixed gatherings, but not in a sense of a wedding or anything like that. Sometimes you have a situation where friends might meet up uh, as couples married, or you have in family setting where there may be non-mahram together. Um, and if we take this example, if everyone is observing the full uh, hijab physically, um, and the conversation is, you know, nothing wrong with the conversation, is there anything per se wrong? Is there anything, to do, is there anything wrong in the actual nature of meeting up as a mixed gathering per se, if everything else is, uh, if everything else is observed? Thank you. Thank you. In principle, in principle, if the Islamic hijab, as far as all the elements, now you all know what they are, so I won't mention it. If all the elements are upheld, in principle, there's no problem. However, let's be careful because there have been instances, and I tell you from experience of cases that have been presented before us, there have been instances whereby couples meet up together with the correct intention and the individual then looks around, tries to lower the gaze, then looks at the spouse of the, the wife of the, uh, his friend, comes back home and says, why is she looking like this and you're not? You know, and always people think the grass is greener on the other side and comparison begins to be, uh, happen and there are problems in the marital relationships and breakups occur and divorces increase. And people, um, uh, for example, unnecessarily may even involve themselves in relationships which are illegitimate. Today, this is the problem in society. Today, this is one of the problems in society. We find that there are many affairs and many illicit relationships, even when people are married, it's simply because of these gatherings that the human being, oh, the, the carnal desires and their whims overcome them, and they would follow the satanic temptations and do whatever they feel that they need to do. If an individual can guarantee themselves and they can say, well, you know, we'll never fall into the pits or, or the temptations of the shaitan, and we can observe all these, then so be it. But notice how Prophet Musa, ala nabiyina wa ala alihi wa alayhi afdal salatu wassalam, Prophet of Allah, ul al-azm, ma'asum, and when there was the two daughters of Prophet Shu'aib, Leah and Safura, right? Well, you know the story, yet when they told him that our father wants to see you, he is a prophet of Allah. If he can say, well, you know, I'm, I'm safe, I'll be okay. If he can say it, or if he said it, then we can say, okay, we'll be safe as well. Although we're not prophets, neither are we ma'asum. He said to them, bring me some pebbles, throw the pebbles, I'll walk in front of you, and I will know the direction by which I need to walk in order to get to the house where I can meet your father. In other words, so that he would not walk behind them. So... It highlights to us the importance of modesty and chastity. We need to be very, very careful. I'm not saying that these gatherings and these sessions are haram. There's certainly nothing in Islamic law that prohibits them. We have main guidelines, main issues that have to be uh, upheld and understood and then becomes up to the individual to practice them. 